Welcome to another episode of the RAG podcast. And for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. Since early 2019, I've been interviewing the most successful and innovative recruitment owners to learn how they rose to the top of their game. In season seven, I'm going to be having raw, authentic and insightful conversations with agency owners, entrepreneurs, leaders, people across the industry. And I want to be learning about their ambitions, what's happening behind the scenes in their agencies today and their plans to navigate difficult market conditions. I'll be bringing you the latest and greatest recruitment stories every single week on Wednesdays at noon across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast on this week's show. I'm super excited to be joined by Alex Antonio, the founder of AL Solutions, a life sciences specialist recruiter headquartered in London, just over five years old that he's grown to 25 staff. Now, the reason I wanted to interview Alex is not only has he grown to 25 people in five years, um, he's also built a portfolio of five other businesses that he does the back office support for and they share infrastructure and he's, he's basically set other people up. But the guy's only 25 years old. He got into recruitment at 18, having said to his parents who wanted him to become a lawyer, to he was going to have a gap year and just work in sales to save some money for university. He then became the top performer at a local recruitment firm, a life science recruitment firm. And within less than three years, two and a half years later, at the age of 20 years old, he went out and set up AL Solutions, Antonio Life Science. Uh, that's what it stands for, Antonio Life Science. So... Incredible guy, incredible energy, so young, at the age of most consultants in our industry, achieved so much. And he looks at the business with energy, with passion, and a level of simplicity, the way he describes how his business is run, that I believe we could all learn from. So you're going to enjoy this episode if you're a recruiter looking to start your own in the future, or if you're looking to grow and you want to, you want to think a bit clearly and a little bit more simply about the, the whole solution. So without further ado... Alex, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thank you very much, Sean. Good morning. How are you? I'm all right, mate. It's good to have you on board. We spoke about this, oh God, how, how many months ago was it? About three, four months ago? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so about three, four you've, months you've ago, made, just you've, before we... You've made me wait, haven't you? You've made me wait. <laughs> it doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot. No, I've been looking, you, forward uh... to, looking forward to getting on board. No, it'd be worth the wait, mate, worth the wait. Well, look, I've given you a brief in introduction there, um, mm -hmm. but I can never do it justice. So for people who don't know you, could you just give us like the bird's eye view of you and your business portfolio today, numbers, headcount, locations, that kind of stuff? Sure. We don't need the detail. We'll go through all that in a minute. But give me that kind of overview for people to understand what you're into. Yeah, absolutely. So AL Solutions at the moment, we are, we're still a small business. I won't use the word startup because I think we're a little bit past that at the moment. We are headcount at the minute about 25 spanning across uh, London, Manchester. And then we've recently actually just made a hire for Miami where we're looking to expand our offices come the end of the year. So we're in like a really good position at the moment. It's, um, you know, it's been like a, the last few months really consolidating, building out the team, building out our leadership um, so that we can then hit the running from January to start our further expansion. But roughly around 25 people at the moment. Right. And you do have a, your finger in other pies you've got like an, an investment portfolio of other recruitment companies yeah absolutely so alongside als i've supported uh by investing and supporting like all back office strategic advice and opening up of uh, five other businesses so they span across tech engineering um re renewable energies as well and they're more of an exec search firm so it means that for us and for those small businesses as well, if they take on accounts where they need extra resources, extra support, we're like a group of companies where we can come together and, we, you know, as, as a total, we're more like 45, 50 people. So it means that we can really support on some larger projects as well. Um, but it's been good for the, you know, for our main business because they're able to share clients, work with each other. We have more like get togethers. It's like a group of businesses and it creates like that larger company feel within a small business for everyone, really. Love it. Love it. Well, well, let's get into it all. But sure. Tell me how you got into recruitment. You're still a young guy. You know, you're not, you've got all yes. this, all this going on. How old are you right now? If you don't want me asking. I'm 25, Sean. 25. Wow. That is incredible. So <laughs> how the hell did this all start? Tell us how you got into yeah. the industry. So, so if we go back to, to being like 17, 18 years old, I was always, I won't say I was like incredibly clever at school, um, but I was, I, I, I did all right academically. I was, wasn't too bad. I've, I've worked extremely hard all the time. Um, but did you know? 
I grew up in, do you know, like, well, I grew up in Surrey, Catrum area. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're always told growing up, uh, work hard in school, get good grades, get a good job. So, you know, I tried to follow that and to do that. And uh, initially, with results coming out, I was quite, I, I did quite well. And it was, you know, the, the idea was I was going to go into like a good profession like law. And um, when I was looking into careers, I just thought, I just want to make as much money as possible. And, you know, for me, I felt like if you've got the right attributes, it doesn't matter what industry you go into. If you're going to work hard, you're going to be disciplined. I think you could be successful in anything. And I wanted to just get started sooner rather than later. So I started looking into sales careers, essentially. Um, recruitment popped up as one of those ones where you can really, you know, run a business within a business. The harder you work, the more you can earn. So started to look into recruitment jobs and pretty much from the plan was, and I don't know whether this was something that I told myself um, or whether it was just to like get buying from family. I said that I'm just taking one year out to work in sales to fund university. And I think subconsciously that was me just trying to let people know that, oh, don't worry, I will still do the academic route and the professional <laughs> route. I'm just going to give this a go. Did your parents put any pressure on you to go to uni and become like... Well, I, th I think for them, it was more a case that nobody in our family had ever gone to university and I was probably the only one that had the grades to be able to do it. So they thought it was the, safer, the safest route, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so for them, I guess, yeah, they, they did want me to do that. And for me, I just thought, let's buy ourselves some time. Let's show that I can really do something else and, and be very successful with it within that year. And then sort of um, never have to go back to plan B. And that's that's essentially what I did. And I remember when I walked into the first recruitment company that I worked in, I was just completely soaked in the culture. There was, there was about 50, 60 people in the office. I remember um, people on the phone with their headsets. There was one guy shooting a bow and arrow at the wall, somebody else playing uh, <laughs> um, basketball on the side. I just thought this just looked, it just looked in, like, incredible. It's everything that you wanted to see from being 18 How years old. And you wanted 18, to yeah. 18, yeah. So just come off yeah. a lads holiday um, the, the, the week the week before and then just got sucked, just got sunk straight into it. I actually sat next to somebody in the first week and I think had I not sat next, sat next to this person, um, it would have probably been really difficult to keep going through the hard times. But he was 20 years old and he drove a Range Rover and wore a Rolex. And I thought, okay, I don't care what happens to me here. If that's the outcome, if you can get that, then, then I'm all in. Um, and yeah, the, the rest is sort of history. So... You, you you joined a recruitment firm. It was where was that in in Caterham or was it in London? Or? It was in the, it was near Gatwick. Gatwick, right? And you careful, yeah. You walked in and obviously it's it's high highly, you know, it's it's that sales floor environment, right? Yeah, so, vibrant. Yeah. What? How did you actually perform? Like, so what was that? Because you were only is it two and a half three years before you then started yeah. your business? Right? So you wasn't actually yeah, started doing it for that long. But what was your individual performance like in those early days? Yeah, so good good question. So I did it for about two years. I started the business when I was 20 in 2018. And wow. um, I joined on day one with a group of like 10 to 12 people. Um, you know how you know how it usually goes. Within four weeks, I was the last person in the group, which made it really good. I had the director one on one. Um, I, I, I'd say I struggled a lot within the first three months. But what I was very good at is I was, I was extremely disciplined and I always had the belief that I could make it work. And, you know, I was first person in the office every single day without fail and last to leave out of the business of 50, 60 people every single time. So I think they knew that I was worth putting a lot more time into and investment into. And the reason I struggled, I think being 18 year, years old, I was a little bit naive. As soon as I got a little nibble and a client said, yep, yeah, send us over your terms, let's work together. I thought, great, I've won a client, let's spend weeks focusing on that and it would never amount to anything. So I um, had a lot of wasted time doing that. And then all of a sudden, the penny just dropped. I walked in one day and thought, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not working with you know, uncommitted clients. I'm not wasting my time. And literally just flicked the switch that day. And then from there on, I build from that fourth month onwards, anywhere between 35 and, and 55, 60 a month. Um, and then wow. in that first full year was the, the, the top salesperson in that contracts team. Um, what, and then- what, were you, what was your market? What were you actually recruiting? So I started off in contract biometrics. So it's all life science focused. And these biometrics people are like the, the data side and the programmers within clinical trials. So ran a contract desk for about 15, 16 months, um, built up a huge network. A lot of the clients I was working with were predominantly wanting permanent people. So I was passing a lot of business over to the perm teams. And then I knew deep down that I was always going to be open in my own business and I wanted to understand and to learn how to do permanent recruitment as well. So shifted markets across 
after about a year and a half or so to the permanent side. All right. So let's dissect that a little bit because I've, mm. I've been a recruiter, you know, a contract recruiter for a long time as well. And um, I had my experience of that. What was your methodology to get into a, to build a strong contract desk? Like I've got my methods. I talked about it last week on sure. LinkedIn. I talked about my, I had this like passive, passive candidate mentality where I just wanted to get to know everyone because I believed it was really obvious that they had an end date. And I was like, if I get to know them now, like when they mm -hmm. end it, and if I can log the fucking end date and I know when it ends and I've got a good memory as well as a strong CRM, I'll, I'll just be on the radar with everyone. And it, it worked really well. What, what was your methodology to this? Yeah. Okay. So I, I believe that you don't need to know everyone. I think you needed really good relationships with a handful of people. I think any more than a contract network of 200 people, any more than that, you just can't keep tabs on everyone. And, you know, 200 contractors, even if you're looking at um, 12 month contracts, that means there's like, what, 18 of them finishing every single month. Well, you're never gonna be able to place 18 people in a month, right? There's nearly one a day working day. So that's more than enough people. So I built up a strong, strong, strong contract network of 200 people. And that's across three different roles within my market. So roughly 70 people in each market which meant that whenever I took on business, I had 70 people to call through who knew me very, very well. And, you know, 10, 15 of them would be available, could send those over and make a placement within 24 hours of sending CVs. Um, and then the, the, the majority of my job was just speaking to every single senior person in the market, um, understanding what their workload looks like, what the, you know, when they're entering new trials, when they're going to potentially need people, and then offering contractors as this easy option for small businesses where, you can't necessarily commit to, to head count. You can't necessarily commit to, to senior hires. That you need that extra support. Then that's where I'd come in and be able to support them. Trial, isn't it? The nature of a trial yeah. is it's got a period, it's got a start and an end date, I suppose. Um, Absolutely. So how did your desk grow in terms of monthly GP? So I think by the time I shifted to Perm Market, we were I was invoicing probably about 40, 40 to 50 a month on average um, and then moved over. Yeah, so how, yeah. Which my question there is, how do you leave that, and what happened to you? Because <laughs> I got to the point. I think I was about sixty-ish, sixty-five when I when I was at my peak, nice. and then I went into management. I went into management, and I started handing, you know, all my leads across, and it slowly just dwindled. But I still earn a lot of money off that. Sure. I remember one guy I placed in January twenty thirteen, and he was still there. I think he was there in just under in twenty nineteen when I checked. I spoke to someone like he, you can put a contract in, and they just don't end, right? Um, yeah, but that was probably what kept me, I guess, stuck to that area. I didn't, I grew into leadership, but I didn't, you know, I didn't even, I probably could have started my business early, but I was like, I'm getting paid so much money off the contract. Book. Mm. Why the fuck would I change? So when you moved to Perm, did you have to sacrifice that? Did you carry on getting paid on it? How did it work for you? So I put up a good fight. So I had probably around, it, 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 the timing was perfect. So there was a quarter where, five or six of my placements turned into perm deals instead of contract by the end of the process. Right. And so, you know, there was around a hundred grand's worth of business that I didn't get paid any commissions on because it was perm and that goes to the perm team, right? So I was really frustrated about that. So I ended up speaking to the directors and the CEO and they let me shift and continue to keep my runners. And for the transition period of about three months, any clients that came to me with contract needs, I was also able to support with that. And the reason I was able to do that is because the biometrics team at this company was me plus two or three other people that joined and left within within a year. So it was pretty much just me doing it. So rather than them losing me as a consultant, they were happy with me not dual desking, but keeping my runners and then and then building yeah. out on the perm. So it made it very easy for me. Um, and you, you know, then, strategically did that so that you knew both sides of the job. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think I always knew it's going to be important to know how to do permanent business opening a recruitment agency. I mean, you can't start off and place. 10 contractors in a month and then have 250k worth of outgoings and, and turnover um, for a new business. So I needed to understand per market. Um, I needed to be able to show clients that I was working with as well that I'm able to deliver on both so that later on down the line, they would come back to me for, for business on perm side as well. And where did the where did the strategic mindset and desire to start your own firm come at, at 19, 20 years old? Hmm. Can you break that down? Um, honestly, I... I I remember there was a, a conversation in one of my friend's group chats when we were 18 and I joined this company and I'd been there for like two weeks and I said, this, this is amazing. Um, one day I'm going to open my own business and do this. And everyone was laughing and I'm like, oh yeah, all right, Alex, because I've always been known as this person, just like sky high ambitions. 
Um, so I think I always knew. I just didn't know when it was going to happen. And I didn't know how quickly it could happen. You know, in my eyes, I thought maybe five or 10 years down the line. But when you're 20 years old and you're taking home regular 10K paychecks and you've got now money in the bank and everyone around you is like, wow, you're, this is incredible what you're doing. And you've got no mortgage, no kids, no real commitment to then be able to just drop that and think, you know, deep down, you think no matter what happens, I, I know that I can make money so I could always go back to it. You've kind of yeah, got that safety net. So you're yeah. living at home with your parents still? Yeah, I was, yeah. I was living at home with my parents. Are you paying, are you paying their mortgage? Are you paying their mortgage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it six months or so. Um, but I rented a little office, a 10 minute walk up the road because I just thought there's nowhere I can work from home. I wanted to still not, not wear a suit, but dress smartly. I don't want to be sitting in my pajamas on, on, on a desk in my bedroom. So I rented a small office up the road, walked there every morning and, and worked by myself for the first year. So when let's go back to that then. So mm. when did you when when was the the time you can remember that was it? Like you were like right, I'm I'm going to quit now. Or how did that? How did the actual you leaving that organization unfold? So I got to a point in that business where I wanted to do more, and there was you know and the, the company's great by the way, and they did so much for me, and I wouldn't be where I am today without them, obviously. Yeah. But I got to a point where I thought, how do I get more? Um, you know, I'm making more. Money, is, money wasn't everything, but it's a lot. And I was making more than my manager, than my director. And I thought, where can I learn to take things to the next level? You know, as far as I'm aware, I'm coaching, I'm training, I'm mentoring, I'm showing other people how to do it. There's nobody really else helping develop me further. So I started to open my sort of eyes and ears to other businesses and met with a couple of directors for some other firms. They were offering huge basic salaries and everyone was so like, wow, let's get Alex on board, let's get Alex on board. And I thought, Rather than shifting, maybe this is the time to just bite the bullet and to, to go off and do it. So I knew that about six months before um, before I left, essentially. Are you spending hours on LinkedIn and cold outreach and want more business coming to you over your competition? Well, if you're the founder or leader of a recruitment agency, here's what we can do for you. At Hoxo, we'll give you the training, support and resources to take you from what I call an offline recruiter, reliant on posting jobs and sending in mails to open up new customers, ultimately looking like every other recruiter on LinkedIn, to being an online recruiter, being seen by over 25,000 relevant people, driving a 200% minimum increase in engagement on your profile, and seeing daily lead lists from LinkedIn that you can follow up with in six weeks' time. And if you don't perform, you don't pay. Now, why can we make such a bold, results-driven promise like this? Well, it's simple. There's two reasons. Firstly, Whilst I've been building the RAG podcast, we've actually done what we say we'll do for our clients. In less than two years, we actually built a business generating from zero to over 1 million views per month on LinkedIn, leading to multi-million pound revenues with a sales team of me plus two people without making a single outbound cold call. Second is our track record. Not only have we done it ourselves, but we've helped over 350 agencies and over 4,000 consultants do it as well. It all in the last three years. Now, if that sounds of interest to you, click the link associated to this episode and we can book a call and tell you how we can help. Right, let's get back to the show. Now, how much money did you put in the bank behind you when you started it? Um, I probably had about 60 grand, I think, saved up. Yeah. So you, yeah, I mean, if you're living at home and you've got 60K in the bank, the risk isn't, you just there is no risk because even if you have a shit six yeah. months, you go and get a job or whatever. Like, I think it's incredible. I just want to say that to you, like, to take the... The, the risk on getting a sales job when you've got pressure to go into university <laughs> and then to, to have the foresight to want to start your own business at that age, mate. I don't know many people that have done that. I literally don't. And mm, I look back at myself sure. thinking, look back at myself thinking I was a complete idiot at that age. Like, I was <laughs> overweight at university trying to play football with a big fat ass. Um, with like, <laughs> honestly, working in a bar, no aspiration, didn't know what I was going to do. I always thought I would probably end up in sales. I was doing a teaching degree. Um, mm. and, and again, it wasn't until I was mid twenties about your age. Now I got into recruitment and that was more cause I was in Australia and I couldn't teach anyway. And I was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll do something to keep me going. So, you know, we all come at our own journey, but yours is, I mean, it's, mm. it's testament that you did it so early. What, where does AL solutions come from? Is it just Alex or is there, is there more to it than that? Like, I don't know. If yeah. So it's, 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 it's Antonio life science solutions. It's Antonio's right. surname. Okay. Um, right. so yeah, it's just, yeah, simple as that. Right. I like it. And that was easy. Name on the book, name on the door, but without the name on the door. You didn't have to put your Absolutely. full name. Yeah. Yeah. So take us it was, you rent this office. Yeah. 
what was starting up like the startup process like for you to paint the picture what it what, what was the world like in January yeah I, I, you know I was, I'm, I'm still young now but I was even younger back then and had all the time energy everything in the world yeah it was two two things I cared about at the time and that was working out and and building the business and that was it so I was in the office just honestly and this is an exaggeration 20 hours a day I loved it I loved everything about it and I loved creating and owning my own opportunity you know the reason I got into recruitment in the first place was you build a desk and you can build it as much as you want to build it and can build it and then when I opened my own business it was that but on steroids right so I just loved it I was just so soaked into it um it was definitely scary. Uh, you, you know, I've gone from earning some really good money to now having nothing, nothing coming in. And I have to make money from scratch, being back to just a phone and a computer and no clients that I'm able to work with because of non-competes. But, you know, that non-compete period was probably the best thing that ever happened. Had I have had no non-compete and just went after my old clients, then I would have been limited because I've just got my set clients. I would have been too busy to do anything else. But it forced me to spend six months building new relationships, winning new business. And I won some incredible clients during that period. And then when my non-compete dropped, I had all of my old clients back again. It was like, wow, okay, we can't do this with just myself. It was so busy. So yeah, it worked out really well. I think it was a really exciting time. I still look back at some of the photos of them. I think life was easier, life was smoother, and it was good. <laughs> what, what sort of numbers did you do in that first year? So first year, I did 440 um, in terms wow. of uh, written. Yeah. yeah. And that's invoiced or cash? Is that cash? That yeah, no, that was written. I think invoice cash yeah. was three 300 and something. Again, yeah. it's, it's like an amazing year as a consultant, isn't it? So you've not you yeah. lost any. Yeah. You've gone. Did you find it was lonely? Did you feel any of the kind of, I don't know, like you used, you're a young lad, you used, you used to have an office of 50, 60 people and, and then you transform into your own your own space on your own did you struggle with that at all or? yeah I, I'm a massive confidence player so one of the things that helped me hugely was when I made a placement ringing the bell everyone clapping seeing my name on you know the leaderboard at sales meetings I love that and I really thrived off of that and that kept me going so going to being a one-man band was really difficult you know you do a placement you look around you look Oh, okay. Right on to the next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you want to share that success with someone a little bit, and there was there was none of that. So um, it kind of made you like numb, numb to the feeling of placements. So it was like, right, okay, yeah. move on to the next, move on to the next. So yeah, that that made it that definitely made it difficult. But you know, I had my girlfriend who I'm still with at the time, and we'd always then go out and celebrate with a meal or a drink or meet a couple of mates or something like that. So always did something, but it just wasn't the same energy. So what did she think? at that time you're 20 years old and you, you're sitting in an office on your own and you know, you've left a job where you were earning really well to, to what, what was her and, and, and also your parents what was that kind of mm. your close-knit family and friends what was their opinion of of this this decision at 20 years old yeah everyone thought it was nuts um i think everyone's gone from you know this 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 guy's gonna go and he's gonna be a really successful lawyer he's very intelligent let's let's push him down that path to I know he's just going to get a sales job like anyone can get a sales job. You don't need any qualifications. You don't have to be intelligent to do that. Why is he doing that? So now, okay, fair enough. He's 18, 19, 20. He's making some really good money. Like now he's leaving that. What's, what's, he, what's he doing? So it was a little bit, everyone found it really confusing. I think my 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 missus was, she backed every decision I made. She's like, right, Alex is going to be, he's serious. He knows what he's doing. Let's, let's back that. And my parents also were the same by that point. I think they got to the point where they thought, okay, maybe he is destined to do more than what we all thought. And, you know, people backed it. It was it was difficult having conversations with like you get my girlfriend's parents, you know, we'd sit around the dinner table. Oh, how's you know, how's work? How's work? Oh, I'm I'm leaving now. They're like, why? <laughs> you know, it didn't make sense to a lot of people. They couldn't they couldn't understand it. But um, yeah, it's just it's just one of those things. I think it's quite difficult for it's a difficult conversation to have because you don't want to sound big headed by saying I want more and I think I can be better than this and you also you know you, it's just a difficult conversation to have I think definitely I think as well like two and a half years isn't actually that long in recruitment no. two years nine months like I did what was I in 2011 and I quit in 2017 to start so yeah mm. I did six years I was a bit older but yeah if I look back into the first three years did I have the skills maybe definitely didn't have the confidence Mm -hmm. You know, so for you, it was, I mean, it's real ballsy to take a risk at that point. So you mm -hmm. go into year one, you knock it out the park, 
Did you say you hired someone in that year or was it just you for the full year? How did it go? So for the full year, I, it was just myself. I hired somebody to join January 2019. And this was somebody that I knew from the previous agency. Uh, so we worked together. And actually, funny enough, he was one of the people when I first come on board, he was um, he already worked there. So he kind of helped help me with like onboarding and help me with the odd bits here and there. He left recruitment for two years. He fell out of like this big agency style and this whole KPI driven business. He just decided he didn't want to do it anymore. I approached him because I knew it would be like a warm entry. I know him. I know his work ethic. He worked the same market as me and um, he didn't want to join to tell you the truth. And I was like, look, I was like, Jack, just join. Um, I promise you it's going to be very different. This is what, this is what the vision is. This is what we're trying to build. Come on and give it a go. Um, And he's still with us today. He's one of our directors and, 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 you know, he was then, sit in that same little office with me side by side and he got to learn everything about me everything the way that i recruit how i do business and yeah and he's absolutely smashed it from there as well so he come on board 2019 and then back end of 2019 we moved our offices into london and hired four or five people to join and we started to grow from from 2019. where in london did you take the risk to go to we we moved initially to um, Lower Thames Street, which is near like Monument, just yeah. over the other side, yeah, the northern side of London Bridge. Um, and we're now we're, we're now pretty much in that area still. We're right by Monument Station now um, on East Wicked. Road. And what made you go into London? Yeah, I think I think recruitment's industry where loads of people want to get into it, right? Which is great for hiring, but it's very difficult to find the right people. And um, I wanted to be in a, a, an environment where I've got, you know, you can, you can, you, you've got a huge source of talent to, to find people from, and yeah. what, what better place than London, Manchester, and all these big cities, these big hubs. So, you know, for us, we've got people that live south, people that live north, you know, east. Everyone can move into London, yeah. yeah. So, just got a bigger source of talent to hire from. Yeah, and in like, yeah, sorry, you've got a limited pool of people that perhaps don't want to travel into London and you get a slightly different... I know yeah. there's like companies like Focus Cloud I've worked with a lot, Lloyd Gordon, they built a big office in Gatwick and then they then built one in right. London and, you know, I can see why they've done that. So mm. did you manage people in the previous job, in your first recruitment job? Did you actually... Were you actually a daily leader, manager, that kind of... Did you go into that level of... of no, I was really selfish. Into, yeah. yeah, I was really selfish. So I, I didn't, I did a lot of training sessions. I trained a lot of people because I, I, you know, I did things in a slightly different way and they wanted me to pass that knowledge on. So I spent a lot of time training people, but I was, I knew that I was going to leave and I just thought, I really just don't want to spend time managing people. I just don't want to be doing it. Um, yeah. So no, I never actually did it, which was, to be honest, if I had one regret is I wish I did. So I understood how to manage under, you know, and learn from a corporate company because that was one of my biggest struggles when I when I opened the yeah. business, really. Also, I was going to ask that, that. See, that was the one strategic decision I made a year. Mm. I think it was I quit 17 and it was the end of 15. I was a team leader, but they were like, do you want to become a manager? And that meant my bonus structure changed. Yeah, my role. Changed. I was less delivery. You know, I was I wasn't really I didn't really have a billing target for a year. And I thought I really, really struggled with it because I'm like, I'm probably going to earn less. And I did earn less. I went from like yeah. 200 grand to like 120 in terms of take home. I was like, but I just bought my house. Like I had, I had the stability in a mortgage and I'm like, yeah. I'm still going to earn decent. I'm still going to earn good money, but imagine what my business skills will be like if I can manage a team. So I did that and I'd look back and think, I, th- I think I could be better at that job. I'm, I don't think I've mm. nailed it yet at all. I'm not, I'm not the best people manager by any stretch, but. I'm glad I've got that done on other people's money and yeah. other people's time. So, okay, let's talk about when you started growing then and you took into London, three, four, five people. How did you upskill yourself and, and did you make any mistakes in those early days, do you think, in terms of leading people? Yeah, I made loads of mistakes and I still make mistakes today. And I think anybody that says they don't is just really not looking at the, yeah, not yeah. looking at things in the right way. Um, so I knew that I could coach and I knew that I could train and I knew uh, I knew how to lead. I think I was really good at build, uh, like I think a good leader can paint a good vision, a good picture and get people to follow and buy into that. And I could do that. One thing I didn't necessarily know was how to um, manage with KPIs, how to manage with getting the most out of people on a day to day basis. And also, um, you know, everything else that comes along with being a manager, you, you've got to deal with everyone else's problems, their family, their dogs died, all these sorts of things I've never really dealt with. So the way that I did it initially, to be honest, is I, I, I the first two or three hires were people that I kind of already knew. So Jack had already worked with, so I knew it wasn't going to be a case of I'm going to have to be on his back constantly. Um, the next person I hired was uh, a friend's brother, 
And again, he was just so in awe of everything I've been doing. I knew he was just going to soak up everything like a sponge and, and really try and um, learn from me. And then the two following people after that was another friend of a friend and my brother. Yeah. So it was like the first group of people was like, it was easy, easy for me to learn this, how to manage peace. How old was your brother? He was, he was, he was my older brother. So he would have been, he's two and a half, three years older than me. So I can't remember oh. people, how old he was. And how was there. that for him to go and work for his little brother? <laughs> Do you know what? It was funny because he, uh, he took, he asked if we'd go out, go out for dinner uh, one night. And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. So let's, let's bring the girls. Let's go get an Indian. He goes, no, 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 just you and me. And I was like, okay, that's, that's quite strange. And we walked in and he was like, oh. I was like, what's wrong, man? He goes, I want, he looked at me, he goes, I want Louis V trainers. I want, you know, I want all of this. He goes, I just want to be part of what you're doing here. It looks really good. So um, that was in, yeah, that was towards the end of 2019. He come on board straight away early uh, January, 2020. So it was, you know it was interesting. I can empathize with that. So my story mm. is me and my little brother got into recruitment together in, in Australia in 2011. Oh, okay. And uh we were both pretty similar. He was a contract recruiter. I was, but I worked in a government department for Randstad. And I'll be honest, mate, there was no fucking commission structure. You were running around. Really? A, it was already like one massive PSL. So it was like a training ground. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't make, I didn't make much money, but I got to like 25 runners out. Whereas Jake had like three runners out and was making big fuck. Cause he, the margins were mental. They were, they were a boutique right. that were just like aggressive and he was making real money. And then, I moved to London, he stayed, moved to Sydney. And then over the next couple of years, we both really flourished. And then it was 2013, we went out, me and my older brother went to see him in Sydney with my parents. We flew out from Manchester. Okay. And uh, Ross was working in, in life and pensions. In like, He was a pensions administrator. Ross is the brightest mm -hmm. out of the three of us, the most academic, good talker, really good with money. Like he's really calculated. I was probably always the kind of dramatic one and Jake was more the aggressive one. He's got like three. <laughs> so anyway, Ross comes out to Australia and it was at first he thought recruitment was just bullshit. I think he thought, but having seen, cause we pretty much paid for everything, me and Jake, like everywhere we went, mm. we were putting our cards behind the bar. And I think, I think it's probably a little bit of a, a bit of a difficult situation when your little brothers sure. are paying more than you. And I remember at the end of that trip, he went, I've got to try this, what you're doing. Like, so I got him a job at Oliver James in Manchester. And now he's like been their top perm biller pretty much every year for the last nice. year. He's been there for, been there for 10 years. He's, he's doing his wow. testimonial okay. now. He's, like, he's, he's a massive biller. But, um, but again, I think it was hard for him to admit it, but actually yeah. he never worked with me. Did you find it hard to work together? Did you ever go like cross the line and argue and, you know, like yeah. brothers do? Yeah, of course we did. I, I think what I found really difficult is... Um, trying to treat him exactly the same as treating everyone else. And I think, yeah. and he's always said it even to this day, he's like, Alex, you did so well at not. I didn't give him any preferential treatment. If anything, it was yeah. it was worse. Um, so I'd be yeah. a little bit shorter with him, a little bit more um, snappy, snappy or, which, yeah, which yeah. I wouldn't do with other people, which if anything, I was actually worse for manager to him than I was other people, which, um, yeah, but it was definitely difficult, definitely difficult. And his career flourished as well. Is he still, he's still in the game? Yeah. So his career flourished. He did extremely well. And he's one of the businesses now that I've invested in to open up. So yeah, um, we spoke about him doing that. Yeah. So, you know, he was never going to work with me forever. Um, and I would never have wanted him to either. I think it's good to have your slightly separate things. But now he's still in the umbrella of companies of ALS. Um, he's got a little bit more autonomy now to do things his own way. Um, and yeah, so it works really nicely now. And there's a much better relationship for us both. Love it. So 2019, you start growing in London. Where were you going into the pandemic then? So if we fast forward another year, what was, yeah. what was life like for you going into that? Um, yeah, so life of the pandemic, which would have been like, I think the first lockdown was March 2020. We yeah, so let's brought... say Q1 2020 was actually a really good quarter for a lot of people. Can you remember your life yeah. back then? Yeah, so when it was a really good quarter for us as well. And we just hired four new trainees um, and then went straight into a lockdown. So it was, it was it was it was a nightmare because I know this you is people business. Five days a week in the office as well. We were five days a week in the office, yeah. So it was like almost overnight, boom. We've got to do all of the training from home. We're going to do everything from home, and we found it really difficult. And even being in the life science sector, and a lot of people don't realise this, but that first scare of the pandemic, this potential recession, it made every business stop hiring. Right? It wasn't just yeah. tech and IT. It was it was life sciences as well for the first few months. And um, so a lot of clients shut their doors. And I remember throughout the lockdown, um, being on Teams meetings with the team, just saying, look, 
no, um, you don't have KPIs, you don't have a financial target. Um, I'm going to fund the business. I'm going to keep us afloat and keep us running. All I want you to do is just speak to as many people as possible and just build on your relationships. Now's a great time to get hold of those clients and prospects that wouldn't answer the phone before. Let's just generate relationships. Whilst our competitors are making furloughs and redundancies and letting people go, we were just keeping our eyes and ears and feet out on the market so that when, you know, whether it was a month, six months or a year to the market renew, uh, resumes, we've now got product to go. We're ready to hit the ground running. And that's exactly what happened. You know, after I think three months was the difficult period. And then from like month four, it was like, right, clients open their doors again. Where are all the other agencies? They're onboarding people again, getting people up to speed. And we were like, right, let's go. And we made yeah, that was our best quarter. Yeah. And how many how many people did you have at that point? Uh, at nine or ten or so. Nine or ten. So we're still small in that period. And did you have any personal um, perception of what people would do from home, and and how did that actually? Obviously, like if all you've ever done is work five days a week, you mm. might feel a little bit like you know people are going to take the piss. They're not going to work hard. Did you have any of those like negative perceptions going into that period? Yeah, of course, um, a little bit. I think what I did really well was I, I hired extremely ambitious people and really driven people so i knew they weren't just going to sit around twiddling their thumbs there was more of a case of okay how can i not just waste their time telling them they have to work without generating any business or doing anything of of a value how can i actually make it so that they're using their time productively so that was the biggest the biggest concern the biggest issue um but yeah i don't think i had any issues like are people going to actually work it's just what work are they going to do and how are we going to make the most of this what did you get them doing just candidate generation and cons just making sure everything's organized and just get yeah pretty much get everything organized all your bullhorn lists your distribution lists get you know all of these conversations developed start speaking to prospects just generate something so that we've got some product to go out in the market yeah. with going into the, so the rest of 2020 and 21 was a was a boom time right there was, there was absolutely a ridiculous and did you get any benefits of covid in terms of working on the vaccine stuff did you did you work yeah. on any of those yeah, so um, a portion of our bu business is vaccines and, and, and that area. And what, what happened was where people paused on the recruitment, they then, our clients started supporting, you know, there was all these partnerships, Pfizer, BioNTech, all these companies worked together. So they all started supporting on these vaccine trials um, for a period of time. And then they were like, oh, we still need all these hires that we paused on six months ago. So it was like, just uh, if you imagine like a hose being filled up, but somebody's holding the hose like that and it's just filling up on this side and all of a sudden you release it, all this water flowed through and that's exactly what happened. It was just a huge boom. So we're completely swept off our feet there. It was a good, good period, good time. And how many people did you have when that opened up? So when that opened up, we had our 10 um, towards the back end of 2020. And then we grew over 2020 and 2021 to maybe like in the 20s um, and we kept growing from there last year actually we, we had a period of time we were about 35 people um right. you know so we had a massive growth but what happened was we grew so quickly and this is again talking about some of the mistakes i've made right. we grew so quickly i let the culture dilute um i let our training dilute i let our quality fall a little bit um because it was just so busy it was like right get people on board, get them up and running as quickly as possible and then start filling business essentially without actually investing enough time and, and quality in doing that. So that's why we've had to restructure, we've had to consolidate because I want this team now of 25 to be so, so, so well equipped with everything they need so that come January, we can scale massively around the right people. You know, we scaled a business to like 35 around a core of like seven or eight people. It's not enough. Yeah. Our core at the moment is now 25. We could scale to 50, 60 people comfortably. Right, so you had seven January. or eight really strong people and then a lot yeah. of, I used to call it the underbelly where it's a lot of yeah. like, underperforming or underexperienced people. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what we what, were. What's your role? How's your role evolved as the business has gone from, let's say, zero to 10 and then 10 to 35, 25? Like, what's the change in your, are you still on the phone doing deals, dealing with clients? What, what, how are you managing your time? Yeah, so I very much lead from the front. I'm in the trenches with everyone as much as possible. Um, you know, I'm on the sales floor. I'm making calls. Uh, I don't do as much candidate work, but you know, last year I still, whilst managing the business, build 800k. So I'm still showing people that it can be done, and I think it's really important because it's like, right, guys, this is how much time I invest in recruitment, and this is how much time I invest on the business, and still build 800k. So why can't you? And this is what we're showing them. So I'm still doing as much as possible. My role has evolved a little bit in the last six months. Now that we're looking at expansion into the US as well, 
Um, I'm trying to spend a lot more of my time focusing on the business and not in the business. And I think where I was working so much in the business day to day, that's where I let it scale to 35 people. And then all of a sudden looked at it, I was going, whoa, this just isn't right. This just isn't where we need to be. What are the symptoms in your business that it's not right? Like, well, well, you woke up one day and was like, fuck, this ain't right. But what were you seeing from a data perspective, yeah. from a cultural perspective? What was the actual physical symptoms that made you realize it was wrong? Yeah, I think it was like a multitude of loads of different things. I think um, quality had dropped in terms of like where we set the bar. Okay, our, our expectations are extremely high because we invest a lot in our people. Yeah. And I was having conversations with people who are underperforming, who was just like, how much do you actually care? Like, why, yeah. why, why are we here if we're happy to be mediocre? We're not, that's not what we're is about. Is that just KPIs? Is it output, in, like the whole thing? It's like the amount the of activity thing. and the, the results. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, we've always been extremely extremely driven extremely ambitious and now we've got 19 20 year olds coming in who are working far less than the people who have been here for years caring a lot less but they're still making money from doing it but it's, it's like mediocre and they'll make a mistake and um not really care about the outcome how it's affecting client relationships and i think we had a couple of clients come back with um some negative feedback which is fine i'm happy to take that on board but it's not feedback i would ever would have thought my clients would ever give us or, or give our business and that's when I started to realize it's, it's the quality is suffering. Um, and, and the reason being is we didn't have enough leaders to look after these people. There's like 25 junior people running around just getting advice where they can. It's not necessarily their fault. It was our fault for, for structuring. Yeah, you've got to take ownership um, of that, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so how did you solve it? Talk, talk us through the detail of what you did. to. So you've obviously cut numbers, but what walk us through that process because that is a very difficult thing to deal with. It is. It's really difficult. And I think, again, it comes with <clears throat> creating that vision, painting that picture, and then almost asking who actually wants to be a part of this, because it's not going to be all smooth sailing. It's going to have its ups and downs. We're going to have a lot of difficulties here because this is our goal. This is why we want to do it. And this is what the reward's going to be for all of you as well. So then it just started to come down to actually having one on one conversations with people in the business, thinking, how much do you actually care about being here? Will you be better suited to other agencies? And you know, we made cuts, people were happy to leave. And it was very much, it was, I think it was very amicable with everyone really, but it was just a case of, if you're going to be part of this, these are the changes that are going to be coming into place. Are you actually ready for that or not? Um, and people were really mature about it and going, actually, Joe, well, Alex, I've had really good fun here, but it's going to be too much for me. And that's fine. It's not a problem. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It's just, we're potentially not right for you at the moment. What are your, like, can you give us some high level benchmark, like expectations you have of, of someone? Yeah, I think it's all down to productivity. So I don't set targets based on how many interviews you generate or how many uh, offers you get in a week. Mine's on what's your what's your what's your actual um, activity level look like? You know, how many uh, senior candidate calls are we making? How many clients are we speaking to? You know, so it's more driven around that. And people find it difficult because they're like all excited they've made this placement. I've had a really you know we do a Friday debrief at the end of the week. What successes have you had this week? Oh, I've got the offer through for, for this statistician. Right, so when did you send that CV? 10 days ago. Okay, so it's not successful this week. That's successful 10 days ago. Talk about the successes you've had this week. What have we done this week to move our desk forwards? And I think that's where people were different in the sense of they were happy. They thought it was a successful week because, you know, they secured an interview for something last week. When actually the successes need to be based off of what we've done this week to push our desk forwards. So that's, I think, where the benchmark is. Um, you know, people... We have a budget, we have a, a, a target. Budget's like the bare minimum expectations. If people are hitting their monthly budget, which for an associate's 15K a month, then, you know, it keeps me off their back. Um, it's, it's all right. You're not going to hit promotions. You're not going to hit high-level incentives, but it, it's you're coasting through. And then your target's 150% of that. So for an associate, it's 22 and a half. Senior associate, that's then 32 and a half and, and so on and so forth as it goes up. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do have fairly high expectations, but... We give the team so much. I mean, I'm still, uh, you know, one or two days a week of my diaries blocked out to sit on desk with the consultants to not just call coach, but actually look at the way that they run their desk. And it's not a grilling session. It's literally like, right, what are we doing now? Okay, wow. What have you thought much about doing this? Why are you structuring your day like that? Just trying to help get the most out of people. And, you know, if I'm putting so much time like that into the people, then we expect to see results. Our trusted partner, Recruit Hub, helps new founders launch their own recruitment businesses in the UK, US, and the UAE. The community is growing rapidly with over 70 founders on the Recruit Hub platform right now. 
everything you need to launch your own recruitment business with ease. You receive 100% of the fees you bill. You own full commercial control of your business and increase its value. You get cutting edge tech stack from ATS to sales automation. There's no admin. Handle everything from community registration to contracts to finance and support. There's no setup costs on the platform, no recurring fixed costs, and no surprise fees. If you're thinking of taking the next step in your career and want to discuss your business idea, please book a confidential chat with RecruitUp's team or learn more here. www.recruit-hub.com forward slash UK hyphen awareness. Okay, let's get back to the show. Yeah, makes 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 perfect sense. And I think I think what you've just said there is really interesting that what you track as success that week is often is I think I think that's guilty in all businesses like you're guilty of mm. looking at what output came out when actually it's the input daily that that will consistently drive that output if all you do is worry about the output mm-hmm. you know it, it's just not you know you're gonna you're gonna hit a cliff aren't you? you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hit an iceberg which is what I think a lot of the industry's done if you look at this last mm. six months a lot of the industry rode the wave of jobs coming in like fucking wildfire, made no client ex- new client relationships, probably didn't even invest in existing client relationships. And then they've hit this fucking cliff where as soon as job yeah. flow dries up, they don't one, they don't have the relationships, the people aren't skilled in the right way to do it. And they've they've hit a real and a lot of them have cut back staff and they're trying to mm-hmm. fight this, you no, know, go back to what they, they whereas if you can consistently nurture relationships. And be speaking to new people as well as existing people all the time. You shouldn't have those dips as bad as others, anyway. You'll, I mean, yeah. economically, you'll, you'll say. So, there's two things I really want to get to over the next 20 minutes. One is sure. the current market conditions and, and how you're finding mm-hmm. things, because I think everyone right now is is interested in in hearing that. But also, mm-hmm. why and how you've gone and out and built this portfolio. All right. So, if we start sure. with the current conditions, we'll then go to that. So. What is what has the last six months been like for you? Twenty twenty, what were yeah seven months of twenty twenty three? Six months, no six months. Um, yeah. What what's the like? Is life sciences recession proof? Like, what have you seen? How have you managed it? I think so. Two questions there. So I think life sciences is more recession proof than a lot of markets, most yeah. definitely. And if anything's taught us that, it's the COVID period. You know, which probably one of the only well, okay, all industries were booming in a recruitment front, but we were booming for a reason. Um, Everyone's always going to need medication, drugs, vaccines, and they're always constantly being developed and bettered. And it's huge for investment, right? So, yeah, it's fairly recession proof. That's not to say that it doesn't have dips in the market. Of course it does, like every industry. Um, Last six months have been a dip, but it's and I think this is the problem. I think people think we're in a difficult market when we are not in a difficult market. We're just not in the, the boom we've had over the last 18 months. That's all it is. So consultants that joined within the last 12 to 18 months have been so privileged. It's been so easy to generate business and to make placements that now we're just going back to where we were in 2019, 2018, 2017 for the last 10 years prior to that. Yeah. So there are some sectors. I mean, the tech sector I'd say has been hit harder than like, there's definitely signs that it's in a worst case scenario than it was in 2019. Mm. Like this, Without a doubt, I'm speaking to customers saying this is the hardest period they've seen in their career since 2008. So there is, I would, I would say across the board, there's certain mm. pockets that are really suffering. But across majority, I'd agree with you completely that you know mm. it is a normalization rather than a than a dip for a lot of people. Yeah. It's just gone back to a normal market. And I just think uh, I'd question a lot. You know, a lot of these companies. I have a lot of conversations with recruitment directors, company owners. I want to understand how everyone else is coping. Um, and I think activity has changed in the last two years yeah, because it has been so easy. Now, even if we did say this was a normalization, people aren't well equipped enough. They don't have the business development tools and knowledge to actually go out and win business in the market like this. So it's suffering more, whether it's a worse market condition or whether the the, the, the level of consultants that people have got are, are lesser. Um, I don't know. But I think it's more the latter. I think it's just the quality of recruiters that we've built over the last two years as an industry is just worse than they were a few years before that um, because they came in at such a privileged time. I think, you know, it's that it's that age old saying of, um, you know, privileged times create weak people, weak people create tough times, tough times create good people or whatever it is, the way that the cycle works. It's, um, you know, just come out of a privileged time. So we've created weak people. Now these weak people are going to 
suffer during this more difficult period. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, mm. So right now, you've seen a dip. Are you are you tracking at the same level as last year? Are you ahead? Where, where would you say you are in terms of revenue and goals yeah. and everything at this half half year point? Sure. So I think we're following from a financial perspective, we're following pretty much the same trajectory as we were on last year, but our FTE is reduced massively. So what that shows me is we've invested enough in our people that they're the people and the team that we've got now are delivering the same results as a team of 35 people last year. So that's incredible. So yeah, it's, um, I'd love to have seen more sales and more numbers on the board, but realistically it was never going to happen with a smaller team. And what it means is going into January, we're going to be in a perfect, perfect, perfect position to grow again. So what are your plans then for that? Because you don't want to make the same mistake again, right? So what what are you no. what are you what have you put in place and when are you going to hire? How's it all going to happen? Sure. So what we're doing now is I'm working very closely with those people that are at like the cusp of senior level, um, not quite managers yet, not quite leaders, but want to get there. So over the next six months, I'm developing those into leaders so that we have more departments, more divisions, more sales teams ready to grow so that when we hire an academy or a training camp in, in uh, January, then they've got enough teams to go into where people aren't looking after more than six, six consultants. I don't want anyone to have any more than six direct reports. So that's the plan. Um, we've got the first hire being made in Miami to join in October. I'll be working very closely with her to get her up to that leadership level as well, show her our culture, the way that we do things over the next three or four months, and then we can start expanding that team. So come January, I think we'll have four new sales teams that we didn't have six months ago, and we don't necessarily fully have today. Four new sales teams of a maximum of six people each is 24 new hires that there's space for in the business. So it's going to work in a much more structured way, a much more rigid way than it was last year. Right. And when it comes to people joining, what type of people are you going for? Like, how are you? Because you, you've kind of gone through waves, haven't you? You've had that initial mm. growth of family and friends, and then you've gone to some junior grads that you don't even know or whatever. Like, what is your kind of ideal person that's going to join the business in 2024? Yeah, sure. So, um, for us, it, there's there's like we've got our three core values, which is energy, belief, and discipline. Okay, so I think that if you believe that you can do it and you believe that uh, it's all possible. And one of the ways, you know, I speak to our team is I say, right, they're in a difficult position. They've got a difficult target they're trying to get through. Um, okay, do you believe in this world of 7 billion people, there's somebody out there that can do it? Okay, obviously there is. And you believe that there's several people that could do it? Yes, okay, so why can't you? Of course you can, right? So the, the second you believe that it's possible, I think people then listen and then take advice on board more as a sponge, okay? So that's the first thing. Then it's um, uh, discipline, okay? And discipline for me, I don't necessarily look at like motivation because we have spurts of motivation. We all get full motivated one day for the gym and not for the next day. But yeah. are you somebody that can come in and do what needs to be done regardless of how you feel, regardless of external factors? Are you disciplined enough to know this is what my day needs to look like? Whether I'm demotivated, motivated, feeling great, feeling bad, can I do this religiously every single day? And if you can do that and you've got the belief and then you've got the energy, the positive attitude, the buzz, the, the excitement, then you're going to be successful. So that's all we look for, essentially. Don't look at grades. Don't look at um, university. Or don't look at... They don't, they don't have to be a grad. They could be 18 years old from college. If they have the right mindset, I think we can, we can make them successful. Wow. I just... Yeah, I love that. Love that because they are the three things you need, right? You, you need to, mm. they, they, they're spot on. And a lot of them, it, you do get companies that have so many of these buzzwords that you think, mm. I don't know, they're just a bit over the top. <laughs> and they're a bit yeah. too hard. Like people are just like, oh, fuck off, mate. Like every company's got these biz. But yours, are, I, I yeah. think yours are just really, really like authentically what you need in the job. Like it's not like mm. you're not doing anything different here. You're just saying to be a great recruiter, you need to have energy you need to believe in it and you need to fucking come and do the right things daily like consistently even however you feel mm. and that's it you're not you're not reinventing the wheel you're just doing it well um yeah absolutely where where did this whole portfolio come about like how did you again it's a bit like starting a fucking business at 20 you then started mm. and load more businesses how many have you got is it five in the five more yeah than it's yours? five yeah yeah so where, where did this start and, and and why yeah i think so the biggest reason i started AL solutions is like to create and own our own opportunity. So people can come on board at 
any stage of their life or career and we, they can they can own their own opportunity and be as successful as they want to be and some people are destined to open a business it's not always the right choice for a lot of people and it's not always the right and it's not always going to make you more money either um, but there are people out there that really want to do it for whatever reason but don't have the business um know-how the experience the network or the connections to do it so my platform is just a way that they can speak one-on-one -on -one with me where like you say i'm 25 years old i'm actually going through it at the same time as them i'm not some 60 year old ceo who was really successful 40 years ago i'm somebody that's actually doing it now so they like the idea of having me there to show them the ropes um and it's just a way for people to then be able to to, to go to go for it in like cringy way follow their dreams and a lot of people do want to open businesses but don't know how to do it and can't do it so we've been able to do that and we've been able to leverage the AL solutions name to, to help them with a lot of stuff um so it just does just make things easier for that uh business owner who doesn't know how to, to own and run a business at the moment and it's like a, a way for them to learn does it, it come from does it come from spotting talent in the business though and spinning them out rather than losing them rather than them going yeah. to go elsewhere or is it you getting external people and just backing people that you meet or like uh, yeah it's a bit of both it. yeah it's a bit of both so you know if i if, if i've got talent internally i want to make sure we can do everything as a business to keep developing this person to get them to reach their end goals now some people's end goal will be to own uh, their own business well what a lot of other agencies if people go to own their own business they're all bitter about it well why, why would that be the case why don't you help them achieve their goal and you know you're going to get rewarded for that as well so i don't think there's anyone in my business that will turn around and go and open their own agency without telling me they'll go alex this is what i want to do it's always been a dream of mine can you help me do it and i'm going to say yes yes of course so you know if they're right for it and then there's other people that i've met who you know it's been conversations about joining us and we turn around and go do you know what actually you might be better off doing this this might work better for you um maybe they're not the right person for us internally, maybe we're not the right business for them, or maybe the end goal for them is to run a business and they would be better at running a business than working within a business. And, and if that's the case, then we can support them in doing that. So it's just do making they, sure that- Do they all share the same office space and be around you all every day or how, how do they work? No, so everyone's got their individual offices, but I've done big group incentives where all of, uh, all, all businesses come into to the ALS office so that we can do like some training together, um, they can share uh, incentives and feel like a big business. If you're a company of two or three people, it's really difficult to create a culture. And for some of their new starters, they, you know, if you're hiring new people, they don't necessarily know what a scaled up business looks like. Come, and, come to the ALS offices for a day, they see it all buzzing, excited and energy, and it really drives these small businesses as well. So it's a bit of both really, um, but they, they tend to have their own offices because they're doing their own thing, their own market. And, the reason for them wanting to open up was that little bit more autonomy. So I don't want to look like I'm managing them as a manager. Um, it's more I'm there for support and advice. And how often will you check in with them? Like, is it every day, every week, once a month? Yeah, I speak, I speak to I speak to them all daily. To be honest, everyone I speak to daily on the phone, WhatsApp, or whatever it might be, and then try and pop into each office at least every couple of weeks for a day. Yeah, like it. So you're mm. 25 years old. You've built. You know, you got you got really one really strong business with with a number of portfolio satellite companies. Like, what does the future look like for you? I know it's a big question, but like, I don't get the vibe like you're going to be satisfied with and ever. I feel like you're going to keep wanting more. <laughs> what's what is yeah. next, and what, what can you see in the future that you you know without going too far ahead? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, we've got we've got a five year plan that's been but I'm still in the process of building and going to roll out to the team as well, because, again, it's all about the vision and, and making sure people know where we're going. Um, but realistically, we're wanting to scale massively. We need to be an international, not a global business, but an international business and have several offices um, across the states and across Europe. And the business that we're trying to build is that when there's an event, when there's an exit, when there's a investment from a PE firm, there's going to be a lot of wealthy people in the company. It's not just going to be the CEO and one or two um, directors. So we've got like an EMI scheme. We've got a real strong career structure in place that can see anybody, people joining the business now in three, four, five, six, seven years time can be a junior partner, a senior partner in the business and actually own part of the business with us. So for us, it's just about scaling. It's just about growing. It's about building on the values and the culture and the environment that we've got now and to make sure that's consistent across all of the offices. So when Miami opens, 
how we're going to go about making sure anybody who walks into that office knows it's an ALS office. You can see it's exactly the same. It's the same culture. It's the same environment. And that's the plan. Um, but yeah, for, to answer your question, I don't think I'll ever stop. I mean, I'm still only 25. I've got so much more to give. Um, you know, some people don't start this till 35, 40, 45. So I've still got many years left in me where I can still go at it and keep building it. Oh, mate, without a doubt. And what, what's life like outside of work? Like what impact has this had? Cause you were earning good money from an mm. age of what? 18, 19, like seven years later, like what has it enabled you to do or, you know, achieve personally as, as, as well as professionally? Yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. I mean, look, with um, money creates opportunity and that's opportunity to help the people around you, whether that's family, whether that's friends. Um, and that's something I've been able to do a lot, which is great. Um, my life recently in the last one or two years, I'd say it's where I always visioned it to be and wanted it to get to, you know, the first few years I had no time whatsoever. I didn't see friends and friends were always really important to me. I, I just, I just didn't have time. And when it got to the weekend, all I wanted to do was rest and recover for a Monday morning again. Um, so I did lose a lot of contact with, 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 with friends, but over the last couple of years, it's been, it's been, it's been brilliant. You know, I've bought my dream car. I go on dream holidays get where, where I get to take my girlfriend and, and family as well. Um, you know, I've now got this, this new house that I bought back in September, which it's, it's a lovely house and it means I can have all the family, all the cousins, all the relatives over for barbecues, mm. enjoy the sun. So I'm getting to enjoy my life a lot more, um, which is actually just giving me more drive, more motivation, more energy to focus on the business as well. So I think at the moment I've managed to get the balance perfect, which I didn't have for the last four or five years or so. But the balance at the moment is brilliant. It's perfect. So can't complain. Mate, do you know what? I'll end it with that. Alex, this has been a one of those episodes that I knew it'd be fun with you, but I didn't quite know how it would go. Um, and I'm, I, what I've loved about it is like, you genuinely are at the age and of most of the consultants listening, never mind the owners mm. listening. You're an inspiration for people to, to take the plunge and to, to go out and um, do their own thing. And even if they're not going to go and be the owner yet, but they, you know, mm -hmm. they can go and make their own career. They can make their own money. They can, they can create their own life. Um, and it is the one thing I love about this sector more than anything. It creates mm. life that without it, I don't know what half the people, I don't know where I'd be if I didn't get into recruitment, right? It's a complete mm. game changer. So well done. Um, I've got every faith you're going to hit what you need to hit. I've loved working with you guys and, and your team this year as well on, on the Personal Brand Academy. I'm glad that you guys are forward thinking enough to not mm. just see, you know, fucking bash the phone, but you're also invested in LinkedIn, you're invested in your brand and it, you know, I've, I've got no doubt there's some really, really cool things ahead for you. Thank you, Sean. Look, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure working with you as well. So I'm looking forward to the future for both of us. Legend. Would, if anyone has listened and really wants to just pick your brains or wants to work with you or whatever, mm. is LinkedIn okay? Best place to just drop you a note because I'll tag you and everything from that. Yeah, absolutely. Tag me in everything. You know, I'm happy to speak to anyone, whether it's people who are in college, not sure what they want to do with their career. They want a little bit of um, advice whether it's people who are leading teams, managing at the moment, they don't know what the next step looks like for them. Yeah, I'm always always open for conversations, always open to network. So happy to do so. Legend. And let's get you back on the show in a year's time and find out how far you've come, all right? Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Yes. Thanks a lot then, Legend. Sean. Thank you as always for listening to today's show. I truly hope that you got value from it. Honestly, it's the only reason I take time every week to ensure that my audience, you guys, future and existing recruitment owners, you're learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. And today's episode is brought to you by my business, Hoxo. I'm the CEO and founder, and we're on a mission to help brand recruitment agencies and their people better. I wanna help people have the tools to stand out in the most competitive markets in the world. We're currently working with over 350 recruitment agencies and 5,000 of their consultants right now, helping them to build their personal brands to consistently win more business attract talent and just become that go-to recruiter in the market. Now we do have a huge coaching program, but a lot of people don't know, we also manage the brands of a lot of founders and we can do the rebrand of that company organizational piece as well. So if your recruitment agency either needs help to look and sound exactly how you want it to, or your leadership and consultant level need to get out there and drive more traffic back to that website, to the business and start using LinkedIn to generate more revenue, 
then you should definitely be reaching out to us. If that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean, a personal message on LinkedIn. I love hearing from RAG listeners. I would love to talk to you. Uh, look forward to it. So I'll see you again next week with another episode. Catch you soon.